Uh, hello, Kevin. Oh, nice it is it is my honor and my pleasure to have you here today. I have told you a million times how grateful I am mm -hmm. to get to share you and your wisdom and your teachings and your medicine and to bring in this ancestral wisdom, this tribal wisdom, this esoteric, metaphysical, energetic medicine and wisdom to people who really need it. Right in this world that we're living in, where we're so disconnected from the earth and disconnected from the medicines and from truth and from ancient wisdom, to be able to bring this to life and to bring it into the the hands and hearts and bodies and minds of so many people is such a blessing. And so, to introduce Kevin as best as I can, and I'll let you take over. Uh, Kevin, I met him many many years ago now while working with the deep and potent medicine ayahuasca. Kevin is a shaman, a medicine man, a facilitator of great healing, a teacher, a mentor, a guide, and a dear, dear friend. And the work that I've gone to do with Kevin has absolutely, completely transformed me. We've got to go really deep, deeper than I ever could have gone on my own. And like I said, to bring his teachings and wisdom and his energy to the healing space is a great, great joy. So Kevin, thank you again so much for being here. Yeah, thanks, Samantha. It's been really a joy for me too to work with you, to get to know you, to become friends with you. Uh, our friendship's really, really important to me and it's been a blessing to watch how much you've grown over the years and all the hard work that you've done. Mm, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. So, you know, this, this whole, this whole movement that we have, and there's this polarizing movement in the world where we're breaking away, we're going super technology, we're going super modernism. Most people don't even know that we are energy bodies living on a planet called Earth that we are interconnected, interconnected with. We have come so far from the wisdom of of the earth and the wisdom of the Gaia and the wisdom of the keepers of wisdom for hundreds of thousands of years. And so I want to start with you introducing yourself and your journey and your journey with this medicine and these teachings and this wisdom and share with us a little bit about that path before we get diving into the great teachings. Yeah. Um, thanks. So, um, uh, I have been studying shamanism for most of my life. I started studying when I was a teenager, and I've always had the, the blessing and privilege of being around a lot of medicine people, a lot of shamans, things like that. But uh, that never really, that was never really on my radar. It was not something that I said, oh, one day I want to be a shamanic practitioner. Uh, it was just something that I was always very interested in always uh, captivated me, captivated my imagination. I felt like there was something really powerful there to be learned and to know about. And um, about 10 years ago, I started on a serious shamanic path when I started my ayahuasca apprenticeship. I spent five years as an apprentice learning all about that beautiful medicine, uh, learning the ways of, of the ceremony and the ikaros, the, the, the songs that go along with it. And um, it started to change my life in such profound ways. And since then, you know, I've gone on to facilitate uh, my own ceremonies. I, I work with my wife, Carol, and um, we've seen just uh, such transformation in so many people. We've, we've poured thousands and thousands of cups of ayahuasca now. And um, I also get to uh, work one-on-one. -on -one. I do individual private sessions with people as well. And I have a handful of students that I teach this wisdom to. Uh, about uh, two years ago, I had an opportunity to go with one of my teachers uh, down in Peru, uh, deep into the Andes Mountains to uh, meet a group of, of indigenous people called the Kero. This is spelled Q apostrophe E-R-O. The Keros are wisdom keepers. And uh, this is what I, I think we're going to spend a lot of our time talking about today. <laughs> yeah, and they gave you your spiritual name, didn't they? Yes, yes, Puma Blanco. Tell us, what is Puma Blanco? 
that means uh, white puma. In Keshua, the, the blessing and transmission that I received from Taita Asensio, who we'll talk about, I'm sure, in a bit. Uh, in Keshua, it's Urak Puma. Urak Puma. Mm. That's amazing. Yeah, and I know you've shared the pictures and told me the stories of going there and what they taught you. And I would love for you to share with us the, if it's all right with you, the, the prophecy share with us what was what is transitioning what is what is coming and why you're here why you're sharing this why do do we get the opportunity to hear this these teachings and how old they are give us a little bit more of that background okay so the uh, maybe the first thing that's helpful to know as we think about this um the Kero people are the genetic descendants of the ancient Puebloans of North America. So the people that we now know as the Hopi, the Navajo, the Zuni, the Ute, these are people of the desert Southwest, the four corners regions of the Southwest. And uh, the story goes that some time ago, uh, there was, so that they, they held a certain kind of wisdom a certain understanding about the universe that we live in and, and our own role in, in that larger universal system. Um, and at some point they began to feel as if that wisdom was being lost or watered down or adulterated in some way. And I, I have some theories about why that happened, but um, essentially a group of these ancient Puebloans left North America in an effort to preserve and protect this wisdom. And in doing so, they made their way all the way down into South America, into the high Andes of Peru, and became wisdom keepers, tasked with keeping this knowledge pure, keeping this wisdom alive and in practice. There's a prophecy, and the prophecy is called the eagle and the condor. And what this prophecy says that, is that the Kero people would preserve this wisdom, maintain its purity and integrity, and then at a certain point, there would be an astronomical alignment, an, an alignment in the sky of planets and stars that would um, indicate to the Kero people that they were at the end of one epoch and at the beginning of another. Mm. And that planetary alignment happened in 1994. And so what it says to the Kero people is you're no longer responsible for being wisdom keepers and preserving the wisdom. Now your role changes and your role is to reestablish this wisdom back to the place that it came from, back to North America, the people of the eagle. So they, in South America, being the people of the condor, we in North America, being the people of the eagle. And so their role changed, and they're now actively trying to reinstate this wisdom. They find people like myself and others who are interested and open to these new ways of thinking, new ways of believing, new ways of perceiving the world around us. They teach that information to us, and then they send us back to teach it to our people back here. And wow. this is how I came to be in possession of this powerful knowledge and this powerful wisdom. That is incredible. And so it, what I'm hearing is it's really now the time not to just hold and preserve, but to get this word out, to get this medicine out. It is about teaching. It's about giving. Yes. The tides have changed. And you get to be one of those messengers, one of that yes. conduit. Well, this is the amazing thing thing about what's happening here today, Samantha, is um, now you become a part of the fulfillment of that ancient prophecy because you're taking this information, you're providing a platform uh, for other people to be exposed to it, and then they'll get this information and hopefully it'll spark interest in them. They'll start to uh, change the way they're living, change the way they're perceiving. They'll teach it to the people around them. And so in a very real way here today in this moment, we're all becoming part of the fulfillment of an ancient, ancient prophecy. What it's is, amazing. It is so amazing. And it's 
you know, that's the, that's the beauty. The thing I love so much is when we recognize that we're not just these random little people on this random planet and it's all just random. There's, there are prophecies and there are connections with the earth there are connections with the stars connection with the timelines. And even myself, my name, Samantha means the listener or God Um. heard. I meant to listen and teach that it's in my human design. It's in everything of my astrology, my numerology. And so all of these fulfillments getting to happen when we listen when we listen to what is being shared we're guided and we carry that on and that's i believe the whole purpose of being a human on this planet is to help one another to guide to teach to enhance and what a time right now when it's so chaotic and confusing and people are really struggling and suffering And I know personally for myself, I have struggled and suffered a lot in my life with a lot of health challenges, energetic challenges, a lot of digestion issues. And that's something that I've come to you to work with. And the framework that you taught me, the something that I hadn't heard before, and I've, I've heard, I thought I heard it all right for Mm -hmm. over 15 years in the healing space as a naturopath and a life coach and a this coach and a that coach. And this framework that you shared with me really felt like a missing piece where I could understand deeper about, you know, I knew energy and we're all energy and we're transferring, digesting, assimilating. And yet what you shared with me, and I'd love for you to show this, this picture maybe now, or when you feel appropriate, that of the framework to understand how we are tasting energy and sharing and processing and, and how utilizing this framework can really help people in a different light in a different way understand their own systems their own energy their own digestion their mental processes essentially how to best utilize their life force energy so would you be willing to share that do you think now's the time yeah yeah sure so um before we get started here we'll discuss a couple of basic concepts about this so first we want to understand that the caro people they're very very practical people very pragmatic they seek to express their ideas and to teach their wisdom in the simplest ways possible. Um, So as we go through this, you'll start to understand um, how that's true. Um, The basis of this teaching is to understand that we live in a universe of energy. Everything in our known universe is a form of energy. We uh, now science tells us about dark matter. So we look into the vastness, the emptiness of space, and we now know that it's not as empty as we perceive it to be, that there is dark matter in the universe. And that matter represents pure potential. Dark matter can become anything. It just needs to be activated and to begin vibrating. And as it starts to vibrate, it takes on mass and then it becomes something. So it vibrates at one frequency, it may become a mineral, vibrates at another frequency, it may become a plant or an animal or a Samantha or a Kevin, but it's all the same source material and it's all determined by the frequency at which it's vibrating. And in this universe of energy, where everything is energy and everything can be described as energy, we find that there's actually only two flavors of energy. And so here we want to adjust our thinking. Uh, We want to uh, let go of dualistic thinking. We're not talking about good and bad, good and evil, light and dark. It it, it just has to do with with the frequency of vibration. Okay. So uh, in, in the whole universe, only two forms of energy on one end of the spectrum, We have Sami, S-A-M-I. Sami is uh, light, it's effervescent, it rises, it's high vibration. If we were to draw a waveform of Sami energy, it would be a saw wave. It would be very active, high peaks, low valleys, very jagged line. This energy is the energy of the universe. It is the energy of nature. It is the energy of Pachamama. It's the sunlight. It's the sound of a bird song. It's the wind blowing through the trees. It's the tree. It's everywhere and it's in infinite supply. 
And we can have as much Sami energy as we want. It's not a zero sum game. It's not a dollar bill. It's not like if you have Sami, then I don't have Sami. It's infinite. We can have as much of it as we want. On the other end of the spectrum is a, is a flavor of energy that we call hucha, H-U-C-H-A, hucha. Hucha is heavy, dense, thick, sluggish, and it sinks. Here's an interesting idea about this. Sami comes from the universe. It comes from the earth. It comes from the Pachamama. Hucha energy only created between people. Hucha energy is the energy of disagreement, of anger, of resentment, jealousy, hate, conflict, war. It's the kind of energy that, that we as human beings uniquely generate between us. Right? And so uh, if we're in a universe of energy, then the game that we're playing in is an energy game. And most of us don't even realize this. Most of us don't realize that we're in that game or that we are actually equipped to play that game in a very effective and efficient way. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do, the winning of this game is called mastering living energy. The Kero people are masters of living energy. And through the fulfillment of this prophecy, the hope is that we'll all become masters of the age. Mm. Because we cannot be truly healthy, truly well, truly balanced, unless we have a highly functioning energetic system. So the game is energy. And the way we play it is three simple steps. We play it through acquisition. How do we acquire this energy? The maintenance is the next step. So once we have the energy, how do we maintenance it so that when it comes time for the third step, investment, how do we know that we're investing the right kind of energy to ensure the outcomes that we want? And that is winning the game. That is mastering living energy. That's winning the game. Mm -hmm. So the game is energy and we play it through acquisition, maintenance, and investment in order to guarantee the maximum return on our energetic investment. Oh, okay. That's simple and yet so profound. It is. It is. Now we all have an energy system. Uh, the problem is that over the course of our life, a process happens called domestication. So domestication refers to like how we're parented, um, the influence of teachers, other family members, clergy people, our culture as a whole. And what happens is from the time we're born, we're born with this highly efficient, highly functioning energy system. But these events in our life, these events on our timeline, the things that happen to us, the, the traumas, the defeats, all of these things, they start to cloak that energy system. And after a while, that energy system starts to atrophy. It's not broken. There's nothing wrong with it. It just needs to be rehabilitated. It's like if you left your arm in one position for a year, pretty soon, that's all your arm is going to be able to do. It's not broken. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just atrophy. And this is true of our energetic system because of lack of awareness, lack of use, lack of implementation, the energy system starts to shut down, right? And so we become sick, <laughs> we become mentally ill, we become depressed, we become tired. And it's all because the energy system isn't working. I'm gonna share with you a couple of pictures here. So, we have that? Yep. Okay. So the, the picture on the right of the screen, this, the, these are the Kero people. These are Kero shamans. These are the people that I studied with. This is where um, I received this wisdom. You'll see that um, the, all of the, the gentlemen that you see wearing the white beaded chulos, these are what are called pacos. These are Kero shamans. The gentleman in the center of the picture 
uh, wearing the tan poncho and the and the tan hat. This is Taita Asensio. Taita Asensio is the oldest living Kero shaman, and he's a very very special kind of shaman. He's what's known as an Alto Mosayuk. And the Alto Mosayuk was in charge of preserving the wisdom. He was the one that oversaw the protection and, and preservation of this wisdom. These are the, the people that I went to Peru to, to visit a couple of years ago. I went to a village high in the Andes, a village called Hapu. It's at 16,600 feet. And I spent time uh, learning Kauro wisdom from these different teachers, the, one, the ones that you see in this picture. The picture on your left is the energy system that I'm describing to you today. So we're all, well, we may all be familiar with the idea of the luminous egg, the energy body, the, the uh, light body, the auric field. This is an idea that's presented in a lot of different cultures and a lot of different philosophies from, from around the world. And this is one of the things that makes it ring true to me is that all of these uh, ancient cultures that, that presumably did not have contact with each other all still came to the same conclusion that we have this energy body. And so the Kero call this energy body the poke po. This is P-O-Q apostrophe P-O. This is a rather idealized look at the poke po. Uh, for most of us, it's not that healthy. It doesn't have exactly that shape. And we'll get into that and explain why that happens. But I want to describe first what we're seeing in there. You can see that inside the Pokpo, the energy is flowing around like currents. There's, there's like ocean currents, right? The energy moving around inside the Pokpo. The Pokpo is where we maintain the energy. This is where we separate Pucha from Sami. And I'll teach you a little exercise here in a minute about how we release the hucha. And then you'll notice that there's this strange thing extending from the body just below the navel, about two or three digits below the navel. It's what we call the assemblage point. Uh, in the East, this is called the lower dantian. And this thing that's extending out of the assemblage point, this is called the Cusco. Cusco means belly. Uh, Cusco, just like the city in Peru, the uh, the pre-Inca people, when they settled this high mountain bowl, they believed that it was the navel of the Pachamama. So being very practical people, no reason to uh, make this difficult. It's the belly of the Pachamama, so we're going to call this place the belly, so Cusco gets its name. In our energy system, this... Um, assemblage of energetic tendrils coming out of the assemblage point. It's coming out of our belly, so they call it the belly. So this is called the Cusco. The Cusco is the tasting mechanism. We bring energy in through the Cusco. Think of this as an energet a, a bundle of energetic tendrils that extend out of the body, through the Pokpo, out of the Pokpo, and out into the world. And there's an aperture at the end of the Cusco that opens and closes. When it senses Sami energy, it opens up in order to take in more energy. When it senses Hucha, it closes, it attenuates to bring down the amount of Hucha energy that we're taking in. A poke po that's full of Sami looks like this. It looks like an air balloon. It's expanded, it has a semi-rigid skin on it. It holds its shape. If you set it on the ground, it still holds its shape. If you set it in the corner, it holds its shape. A poke po that's full of hucha begins to look like a water balloon. So it won't hold its shape, it's kind of a blob. If you set it down, it blobs out. If you lean it in the corner, it blobs out. It won't hold its shape. What we're looking for as masters of living energy is to have our po, po fully expanded, to always be full of Sami, to be wearing a po, po that looks like an air balloon. You'll notice that the poke po is shaped like an egg. It's fatter at the top and narrower at the bottom. And this is because inside the poke po, as the poke po is cleaning and maintenancing, 
The energies are separating. The Sami is rising. Sami effervesces. As it's rising and expanding out, it gives the Popo that shape. As Hucha energy is sinking and descending into the bottom of the Popo, it pulls on the bottom of the Popo. And this is why we get the narrow part, the narrow shape of the egg down at the bottom. This also acts like a funnel. In a little bit, I'm going to give you a simple exercise to open the bottom of the popo and allow hucha energy to drain out and new fresh sami energy to come rushing in. Are we good so far? Yeah, this is um, this is great. And, yeah. So let's talk about that little exercise first. Uh, very important that we rehabilitate the energy system. Uh, we can't be truly healthy. We can't be truly whole. We can't be content, happy, joyful, at ease, full of grace, having an abundant life if the energy system has not been adequately rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. So the way that we're going to start rehabilitating our energy system is to put it on notice that we know it's there. We're going to acknowledge it and let it know that it has a job to do and that we want it to start doing that job. And so the exercise I want to give you, typically we'll do this every day for about a month. Um, after that, your energy system should be coming back online and then it's no longer necessary to invest our energy in the exercise. Now we just moved on to doing great and wonderful things in our life. So the exercise is simple. It only takes about 20 or 30 seconds. Now, I want to encourage everyone not to get caught up in the exercise. The exercise itself is not really that important. It's just a way to put the system on notice. So every day, I want you to go outside and sit down, point your root chakra at the earth. So the, the root chakra is the bottom chakra. It's at the perineum. It's between the genitals and the anus. You don't have to sit in a lotus position or like you're meditating or anything like that. You can just be comfortable you sit on the ground, you, you uh, point the, the, the root chakra at the ground, and you, have, you visualize this picture in your mind. You see yourself inside of your energy body, inside the luminous egg, inside the poke po. And just make a quick assessment. How much of that space is being taken up by hucha? How much of it is being taken up by sami? So I sit down on the ground, I take an accounting of my energy, and I say, oh, well, you know, it's kind of been a tough week. I feel like I've got about 35% hucha, 65% sami. Then in my mind's eye, I visualize the bottom of the popo opening up and the root chakra opening up. And I freely allow that hucha to be released out of the popo and go into the earth we're giving this energy freely to the Pachamama. The Pachamama wants this energy because the, she uses this energy as fuel to create more Sami, much in the same way that she does with death and decay. There's an animal or something that's lying on the ground. It's, it's dead. As it decays, the Pachamama is breaking it down. She's breaking it down into its constituent parts and using that to create new life. So there's nothing wrong with, with giving your hucha to the Pachamama. She wants it. Feel free to do that. Now, an amazing thing happens when we release our hucha in this way. Nature abhors a vacuum. So think about this as if you've just taken a bottle of water and you've taken the cap off of it and you flipped it over. The water doesn't just run out like a faucet. It's not constant runs out for a little while, then it starts to slow down as the vacuum forms inside the water bottle. And then that vacuum sucks in air, that air fills the void, the vacuum is released, and more water comes out. This is exactly the process that's happening when we're doing this exercise. As we're releasing our hucha, giving it freely to the Pachamama, a vacuum forms inside the Pokpo and Sami energy rushes in to fill that void. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to make any effort to take that Sami energy. It's just a natural process by the laws of physics. So it's a very easy exercise. Don't spend a lot of time on this. Don't give it a lot of effort. 20, 30 seconds a day. That's all that this requires.
That sounds very reasonable and very doable. That does not sound complicated at all. I do right. have a question for you. Okay. And this is personal. And I'm assuming that this will probably uh, go for a lot of people. So what about when we learn about this and we start doing it, we start releasing. I know we're supposed to do it every day for 30 days. And then life gets busy and you forget for a day or two. And then you forget for another day or two. Do you start over for 30 days? Does it have to be every single day for 30 days? You just get back on. How does that work? So the 30 days is kind of general. Over a period of time, you're going to feel your energy system start to come back online. Mm. This is when you know that you can stop the exercise, right? So it comes in, a, it comes in the form of a general feeling of well-being, a sense of contentment and calm in our lives. Uh, we start to handle our challenges in a calmer way. The world's not rocking us so much, right? What we're experiencing here, so think back to the analogy of the water balloon and the, and the air balloon. Uh, when you apply energy to a, a water balloon, when you poke it, it vibrates all the way through the, all the way through the water balloon, right? Apply the same energy to an air balloon and what happens? It just bounces off. That's what we want, right? And you'll start to feel that. You'll start to feel more resilient, uh, less impacted by the events of, the, of our lives. These little events don't cause these big earthquakes in our life, right? We're more capable of, of handling and processing the energy of those events. We start to feel that in our physicality. We start to feel that in our psychology. We start to feel that in our emotional life. That's how we know that this, the system is coming back online. That is such an interesting way. And thank you for sharing those metrics to, to note, right? Because a lot of people might think, oh, well, how do I know if this is working or not? And so being aware of that can be really helpful. And I want to bring it back a little bit deeper into why I discovered this while you shared this with me I was sharing with you that I've had a lot of challenges with my digestion that it feels just tight I could feel my anus my stomach my whole system just felt really tight and although I have the perfect diet I've done all the cleanses I do the energy work I do the meditation I'm I'm doing it all right but something in my system just feels atrophied or just very very closed off and what you were sharing was well you asked me about my history and my childhood and my upbringing, and I got to share with you a lot of trauma and a lot of stress and a lot of trauma and a lot of stress and a trauma and stress and dis-ease and all sorts of things. And I remember what you shared with me that when that happens, time and time and time and time of that kind of experience that the that the tendrils can get so shut off and then they can actually close at the the meeting point. And I want, I, I thought that was very interesting where the body is like, nope, I just can't, I can't do it anymore. And it, it gets so shut and that can create a lot of constriction within the system. And I'd love for you to share a little bit deeper on that. Cause I feel like that is such a big missing piece in the world where millions of people suffer from IBS, suffer from hyperfibromyalgia, suffer from all kinds of dis-ease, which can really be connected, especially since most people have experienced a lot of trauma and stress. So tell us a little bit more about how that happens. Right. This is a great subject. Okay. So what happens is when the energy system starts to atrophy and shut down, then we start to lose control over the energy that's coming into the popo because this is supposed to happen out at the end of the Pusco. It's supposed to be flexible and discerning so that when it tastes Sami, it opens. When it ta tastes Hucha, it closes and attenuates. Once the system atrophies, the Pokpo stops maintenancing the energy. The Cusco says, ah, oh, the processing plant is offline. It starts to atrophy. And somewhere in here, the end of the Cusco freezes up. So for some people, it may be wide open. For other people, it may be closed down. And luckily for most of us, it's somewhere in the middle. But as energy is entering the Cusco, traveling down the Cusco, as it passes the assemblage point, in an effort to 
meter and regulate the energy that's coming in, we start to squeeze at the assemblage point. We start to squeeze on the Cusco in order to, to control the energy that's coming in, right? And we, we first start to do that by engaging our muscles. This is why a lot of people very early in life start to complain about lower back pain, hip pain, stiffness in the middle of the body, things like that. If we continue to do that over the course of our lives, we see something really interesting. Let me see, let me see if I can stand up and demonstrate this. So uh, this might be a little tough. Okay. So at the assemblage point, once we start squeezing here, the body starts to collapse in on the assemblage point and our posture starts to get really bad. Now that might have been that might have been useless and hard to see. <laughs> no, we we see it and and that's that's what I shared with you as well. You said how are your hips tight? How are your yeah. shoulders internally rotated? Neck Every, pain, hip pain, back pain. Everything will internally rotate as we engage our body in the squeeze. And that's why we see old people that they're they're kind of walking with their butt down and their midsection caving in, and their shoulders hunching over. Eventually, they may even get a hump on their back. That's, that's how it manifests in our posture, but it also has an effect on internal systems. The, the first system to be affected by it is your digestive system. Then it, as, as time goes on, it can start getting into all kinds of other problems, urinary tract problems, uh, uh, reproductive uh, systems, issues like it, it it can really start to have a major effect as over the course of our lives our physical bodies literally collapse into the assemblage point yeah yeah, yeah and looking at this from different lenses because i've looked at this from a lot of lenses you know we talk about well stress stress is the right but nobody really identifies what stress is it's an energetic right it's a, right. it's it's energy and how our bodies interpret and respond to stress especially when it's it, you know all of our major organs are between our chest and our genitals that's where almost all of the most important organs are apart from our brain and so what does our body do well it shuts off it squeezes it protects it closes yeah. right and that constriction and like you were saying you you know it affecting all of the major organs affecting this the musculostructure affecting well the nervous system when everything is pinched how can you think properly? How can you digest and create your nutrients, your vitamins? How can you be in your creative energy? How can you create life? All of this infertility, because women, right? All of those organs, what is exactly there? Our reproductive system. And so when that's all atrophied and squeezed and constricted and turned in on itself, well, there's no flow. And we know right. that energetic life force needs to be flowing. And so this made me really think, wow, how many billions of people now, billions are being affected in dis-ease due to this system of shutting down and closing off and squeezing and turning in on itself? And how interesting would it be if people were start to be aware of this system and how that can open things up and alleviate so much trauma from from all of the drugs that they're being prescribed and all of the surgeries and all the organs getting cut out and all of the fertility medicines and the neurochemical medicines and these medicines which are not medicines in my opinion they're they're drugs and they're not actually fixing anything they're masking but they're the masking the band-aiding is actually sticking it in that in that same position it's not opening and flowing it's just further uh, hiding and and wrapping up the issue and so this this framework it's it's it can it can be the thing to really help people see and understand in this way how to be the masters of living energy and open up and truly heal from the inside out yes it's such a foundational thing right like we we can make a lot of effort in our lives we can do a lot of practices we can take the workshops and study with this guy and that guy but the bottom line is if our energy system is not functioning functioning efficiently, then we're operating with, with a handicap. And it's just something that we don't talk about in our culture. So, of course, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of, of addressing symptoms, 
but we're not actually addressing one of the root causes of all of this disease and discomfort. Yeah. When we're doing this process of releasing hucha and, and uh, getting this system highly functional, we're, we're doing a, a system for ourselves. It's called mukai, M-U-K-A-Y, mukai. It means to digest. And we, we, when we eat food, we don't think about it. We just eat food, our body digests it, it separates the, it breaks it down into its constituent parts. It stores the vitamins, the minerals, the fibers, all the beneficial stuff from the food. And it excretes out what's unnecessary and not useful for us. Working in the energy system, it's exactly the same thing. This needs to be subconscious. This needs to be happening all the time without us thinking about it. That's why I say only do the exercise for a certain amount of time and then stop doing it. Use that time and energy to do something else beautiful and creative and productive in your life and let this process happen in the background. We enter a very special state, a sacred state called Aini, A-Y-N-I. Aini means sacred reciprocity, always giving, always receiving. So that 24 hours a day, without us thinking about it, the energy system is digesting, it's taking in energy, it's maintenance and cleaning it up and letting go of, the, of what's not useful and beneficial for us. We want to stay in this state of sacred reciprocity, the state of Aini. That's what we're looking for. Now, now we have a foundation to build on. Now we can achieve all of the goals that we have for ourselves in terms of our physical health and well-being and staying in shape, uh, learning new things, being mentally, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually strong and energetic. We have to have this system together before we can accomplish really any of that stuff. Mm. Wow. Is there anything else that we need to know about Aini or about this system? Or is it, is there anything deeper or is it really, is it really that? Is it really, can it be simplified it, it in that way? It really is that simple. Um, maybe at this point, it would be good to talk about um, a couple of things here. So um, let's talk about the way that your energy system is functioning. So and the way it's supposed to function. If so, imagine that you're, uh, you've probably all been in this situation. You're walking down the aisle at the grocery store and you see some woman walking down the aisle towards you. You've never seen her. You don't know anything about her. You have no reason to prejudge this person. Something deep inside you says, I don't want anything to do with this, right? You get what? a gut feeling about it. That's some very interesting language. You feel it in your gut. And the reason this is happening is because your Cusco is extending out and her Cusco extends out and they meet in the middle and they taste each other's energy. And in a lot of information is being carried in that brief moment. And this is where we get that feeling about people maybe that feeling strong enough that you turn around and you go down the aisle the other way and you start walking up the aisle and then you see there's this guy coming down the aisle toward you and something says oh wow like that person looks so interesting i just want to get to know them i want to be around them i should go introduce myself right so the difference is you're tasting energy from a person who has a lot of sami versus a person who has a lot of hucha Okay, and the, the reason that we, we want this system functional and that we want this system to maintenance energy and clean it and release hucha and store sami is because of something we call sympathetic resonance. So the best example I can give of what sympath sympathetic resonance is like the law of attraction, right? It means that the kind of energy we put out is the kind of energy we get back. So if I take two guitars and I tune them up and get them ready to play and I set them face to face and then I apply energy to one of those guitars by plucking a string, the energy of that sound leaves that guitar and it travels through space 
and it hits that other guitar and something amazing happens that same string on the second guitar starts to vibrate it's tuned and ready to vibrate at that frequency and so it does it takes very little energy to activate it this is the same thing that's going on with us and our energy system Samantha, I hate cliches. <laughs> and the one that used to bother me the most was you create your own reality. I love that one. That's the one I say all the time. <laughs> I put back on this so hard. I was like, no, no, no. Reality is happening out there. It's happening to me. I have no control over it. Then I learned about this system and realized that like, if you're putting out Sami energy, Sami energy is being activated in the world around you. If you're putting out hucha, hucha energy is being activated around you. We we all know this guy. We know bad luck Joe. He lives under a shadow. He has terrible relationships. He hates his job. His car's always the one getting broken into in the parking lot and his backpack being stolen. Bad luck Joe. Poor Joe. And then we know like this other beautiful woman she's got a Midas touch she's like Samantha everything she wants she gets everything she tries to do it just works out in her life right it looks so easy for her it's because you have a lot of Sami and you're activating more Sami energy in the world around you thus this irritating cliche of we create our own reality actually is true we want to have this healthy system so that we are projecting and investing Sami energy out into the world around us so that that's what's activated. We're getting more of the same back. This is the return on investment that we're looking for when we start, uh, you know, rehabilitating this energy system. This is why we're doing it. And eventually we learn wisdom and we learn discernment and we learn how to withhold our energy. I don't invest any energy into anything until I know the precise outcome that I want. And then I only invest the energy of that outcome. And I'm far more likely to achieve my goals, to get what I want, to win the game when I'm mastering living energy at that level got a highly functioning popo i've got a limber flexible discerning cusco taking in energy i'm maintaining that energy i'm releasing hucha i'm in aini i'm taking in sami i'm investing sami in my life and i'm winning the game i've mastered living energy and i'm getting what i want this is within everyone's grasp you you don't have to be some kind of you know enlightened person or a guru or anything to do this simple little practice you can get your energy system back online and actually start exerting some control in your life mm -hmm. this should make us all very optimistic all so very very powerful powerful co-creators of the reality that's happening around us mm -hmm. And that is exactly it, Kevin. You just summed up the whole way to win the game of life. <laughs> that is it. And yes, it looks in different ways. It manifests in different ways for each of us. And yet that is the path. And something that you said, I, I want to expand on a little bit because the guitars, uh, this is something I just watched a, a video recently again, where there was one musical instrument that vibrates and it was tuned at, at, say 432 and then there was another instrument that was tuned differently 444 and they ding it and nothing happens to the other instrument when they tune it to match the other instrument they ding it and then it vibrates right. and like you said with the guitars something that you told me once was that it's uh, law of attraction you you kind of positioned it a little bit differently than i had understood it it's what i had understood from what you said was it's not so much that we just attract the same energy to us but it's actually that we activate the yeah. same energy yeah. within us so when we're out in the world it's not just that we're just pulling in but our energy is actually stimulating and and yeah. activating similar frequencies and then that pulls towards us that's it that's it like attracts like yeah. so once that energy is activated it comes to you you're the one who activated it that that good, rich, 
light Sami energy comes to you. Yeah. Yeah. We're very, very powerful. And that's another reason why in this, in what I'm creating in the world, why I'm activating and helping activate people into their highest, into their most optimal self, into the mastery of their energy in their life is when someone's walking around in the mastery, they're living energy mastered and embodied. Well, when they go out and touch the world, when they go out and speak to people or do their life's purpose, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to activate and through osmosis, share that energy and elevate, right? A rising tide elevates all ships. And sometimes, and I want to make a note, and, and this is something I've noticed, and maybe you can add to this or share about this. What I've noticed is sometimes that activation isn't always easy. It isn't always the most pleasant. Sometimes if you're in your greatness and somebody is in their their uh, smallness or in their victimhood or in their shame or whatever the the hucha energy sometimes your frequency might trigger them in their frequency and that can create some kind of clashing of energies and yet that can also be a really beautiful thing sometimes you can trigger somebody into a different experience or a different embodiment of themselves or into a different realization so yeah. can, can you talk about that a little bit because this is something i notice with a lot of the people that I work with who are really in the mastery, they say that they trigger other people or that there's there's a challenge that they have with a resonance. And I, I'd love if you could expand on that a little bit. Right, so um, I think a good place to start here is, <clears throat> let's think about what it feels like when we're triggered, okay? Um, you notice that people who have, have mastery over their energy they seem to be aloof like people can say something terrible to you and you're like eh, i don't care none of my business right it's because we don't have that kind of energy in our system to be activated right so that, that that's why it doesn't bother us so uh, in the example that you gave of someone with a lot of Sami, with a lot of high frequency output, activate, you know, triggering someone else. What we're looking at there is at some point in, in their life, that person experienced a person with high frequency output and something went wrong, right? Some misunderstanding occurred some resentment or jealousy occurred and it's attached to that frequency of energy and so they they're carrying around the, the the heavy dense energy of that trauma of that misunderstanding of that resentment and jealousy and you're activating it in them it's what it's stirring up for them okay I don't know if that's a great explanation, but it, what it points to is that we're we're trying to clean that kind of energy out of our system. So when we're being activated by somebody, when somebody's triggering us, when they're pushing our button, what's happening is they're activating an impression that's left residual energy. If 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 my dad said something to me when I was 11 years old and, and it was traumatizing for me, and then you come along and say something to me that sounds a lot like that thing he said to me when I was 11, you're activating that energy in me. And now you're no longer dealing with 56-year-old Kevin, you're dealing with 11-year-old Kevin under the influence of that energetic pattern, right? And so what we're trying to do is to, once we have a, a, an optimized energy system, is to pay attention to what triggers us, what makes us react in these patterned ways. You say this to me, I react the way I always react, and it ends in an inevitable conclusion. Right. We want to build our energy system up to the point where we recognize our own patterns. We recognize our own behavior, the way we react, how and why and what we believe and how that spurs up, spurs our actions and our words and thoughts. 
and eliminate those from our lives, overcome those uh, moments of domestication in our life, those moments on our timeline, rid ourselves of that energy, rid ourselves of those patterns, change our behavior, master our energy. This is something, this is a topic that I could go into for hours, Kevin, and I wish we had hours and hours. But the one thing I, I want to say, and this is something I notice a lot in my personal life with, with people I know or in my coaching with my coaching clients, often when somebody has a trigger, whether it's I'm not listened to, I'm not heard, I'm not good enough, I'm not valued, whatever that 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 domestication, that program, that code that's inside, I'm ugly, I'm fat, I'm stupid, whatever that that I'll call it a limiting belief or a program, that's a right. wound. And what people do, I've seen, is that they want to protect that. You cannot say anything that will trigger me or I will disown you. You cannot do anything. You cannot shine too much. You cannot be successful. You can't do anything that could that could touch this wound because it's like an ex exposed nerve. And so people protect it. They hide right. it. They control other people so that no one could do or say or reflect anything that could vibrate that. And they hold it inside rather than let it be poked, let it open, let it be seen and felt and processed and released. Yes. Because it's not the other person hurting you. It's you already having a hurt that is being poked. And the thing is, is that when somebody is poking you, it's, a, I believe it's a soul contract to excavate rather than just further bury. And this is something I wish that everyone could see when you're triggered. It's a gift for you. It's a gift for you to be free. And yes. that's something that you shared with me as well, Kevin, is when you notice something come up to trace it back, where yes. does that come from? Tell us a little bit about that, because this is just so good. This can set people free from their triggers and their old wounds and their pain. So, so can you bring us through that, that process just real quick of when something comes up, how do we trace that line to be free? Yeah, so this is how we liberate ourselves from the effects of residual energy, the, the energy of our domestication. Look, we, we, we all experience it. No one is exempt from this. We're all raised by somebody. We all live in a culture. We all have these influences on us. When we get a strong energy system, we're capable now of addressing what is triggering us, what is activating that in me. And then we acknowledge it with compassion for ourselves. This is the thing. We tend to beat ourselves up when these realizations come along. We need to understand that, like, I didn't choose most of this. Most of this was imposed on me. What I think, what I believe, how I act and react, this is all, this is all the manifestation of our domestication. With our will, the most powerful gift that God gave us, with our will, we can identify, oh, right, when Samantha says this kind of thing to me, I get this sensation, I feel this way, and I have this reaction. Then I say, why? Why, why does that bother me? Like, why should it bother me? And I trace it back, and I look into my life, and I look into my childhood. Like, a lot of this starts when we're very, very young people. And we, we, we find the moment, oh, right, yeah, it's because of that thing that those kids did to me in middle school, something that was said to me or done to me, and now that's bringing that up. Okay, is that serving me? I mean, it was a moment in my life, but now it's been affecting me for decades. Is that worth it? Or am I going to interrupt the pattern, interrupt the behavior, interrupt my reaction? And with my will, move beyond it and release the energy of my past. Let it, just let it go. Feel it, experience it, name it, acknowledge it, trace it to its roots. Great, now I'm done. I don't need it anymore. Let it go. Release it to the Pachamama in the form of Hucha because that's all it is. It's not bad. It's not evil. It's just heavy and dense. So that becomes part of the, oh yeah, there's that thing. There's that heavy, dense energy in me around that moment in middle school and what those kids did to me. And then here I go, oh, releasing it to the Pachamama. 
giving it freely, being an Aini sacred reciprocity. I'm allowing Sami energy to rush in and fill the space of that. Now, all of a sudden, I don't have that trigger. Now, somebody says that to me and I say, ah, none of my business. I don't really care. Right. But here's the really magical thing that happens, Samantha. When we do this process for ourselves, when we address these issues of ourselves with compassion, realizing I didn't choose it, it was done to me. Well, now we're looking at the people around us and we're seeing them with compassion and saying, oh, right. Yes, Joe was raised. He was domesticated, too. I'm not seeing Joe, the person, the soul, the spirit Joe. I'm seeing a manifestation of Joe's domestication. I meet him with compassion and realize that he has to also liberate himself from that domestication. Now I'm not blocking him off. Now I'm not unfriending him or ignoring him, building a wall between us because other people matter. We don't want to do that to other people. We want to be open, loving, compassionate, accepting, and see the real person behind it. See the beautiful soul behind the domestication. That's 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 everything. It really is. And something that we see all the time is this domestication or the programming or the codes or the wounding as we carry it around. And it is vibrating and activating right we when we carry around a deep identity wound or a deep core wound or these deep programmings we will often continue to trigger it in our reality and and see it mirrored to us and see it reflected to us and i remember yes. you sharing you know i had my own frameworks around this but i remember you sharing that the poke po then gets a little indentation as we yes. hold this thing i am not lovable okay say i have a code in me that says I am not lovable from this thing that happened in this thing. Well, it, you said it, you help me a, a understand it. it creates like a dent in the right. energy field. And so that dent is an energetic distortion, which will continue to create events and situations and pull people with the yes. energetic distortion. A great example of this is how a lot of women specifically men do it too, but a lot of women will continue to date the same kind of men over and over right. and over who are abusive, who they know is not good, but they do it over and over. This is something that intellectually doesn't make sense to people. But when you see it from this perspective, okay, well, my father treated me this way. And this is my way of understanding love and how I am not lovable on the inside. So I'm going to continue to attract that because the indentation and the energetic warble then creates and attracts that. Right. And this is something that when we utilize this framework and we, oh, we clear that, we have compassion, we go back, we release that energy, the indentation of the warble expands and heals, we right. no longer attract that. Yes. The, the, the energy of trauma, the energy of the experiences, it, it, it leaves a dent in the poke po. We're all walking around with poke po's that look like we've been in a demolition derby. Right. That, that, that's why we want to poof them up and be resilient. That if you, you know, from the outside, the, the impression is concave, but you're inside the poke pose. So now you're looking at it and it's convex as the energy flows in the poke po and it flows past that moment. It distorts it. And that distortion, that distortion wave, as it moves through the poke po, we engage with it. And that sets up our behavioral pattern. That energy, I always react in the same way. It always leads to an inevitable conclusion of me getting angry or hurt or frustrated or whatever it is. And I have a random release of energy. Now that energy is out in the universe, making more of the same kind of energy, putting more weight on the impression. Yeah. yeah? Reinforcing yeah. it. We're becoming more and more susceptible to it. It starts to take a life of its own. This is the demon we don't want to feed. We have to starve this demon out. And we do it by recognizing our patterns, interrupting our patterns, processing the energy of our past, releasing it, allowing Sami energy in. So the Sami energy pops the dent out. Now we don't have the button. We no longer have the impression we cannot be activated in that same way. And this is this is this next level. And I really, for everyone watching this, I really want you to see it this way is 
we talk about a lot, well, your thoughts become your feelings, become your behaviors, become your reality. Or we talk about, well, the subconscious creates everything. And I, that is true-ish, but it misses the energetic component because when you just think, oh, your thoughts become and we don't your world, but we don't take into consideration the energetic effect and the the indentations and the warbles that are happening, it becomes too reductionistic. So right. more than just what you think or just the subconscious, we have to think about these energy patterns. And when we can use this framework and and understanding the poke po and understanding those indentations and puffing them out. I feel like this is a hashtag, puff out your poke po. <laughs> when, we, <laughs> when we can do that, we can understand it in such a richer level. So for everyone here that knows about subconscious reprogramming or epigenetics or your thoughts, take this framework and let it permeate you and understand it in a more robust way, understanding the energetics that are at play within these systems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about it in terms of the negative effect that it can have on our energy system and on our life that we're trying to lead. But, but the same is true on the positive side of this. Like your, your thoughts are so powerful. Your words are so powerful, right? This is energy that we're sending out. Yeah. We can't see it. It's hard to quantify it, all that stuff, but you know, we, as we, as we master our living energy, we, we need to be careful what we wish for because uh, more and more often it becomes true. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's why uh, when, you know, cursing is called cursing for a reason, mm -hmm. right? So who, who are we in the parking lot or in line at the bank sitting in traffic? Like where, where are our thoughts? Where are our words? Where are our actions? Like they lead to something. So we should be very discerning about how we use those things and try to use them only for the higher purpose and for our own good. Yeah. Mastering language, mastering the word. Your word is your wand, abracadabra. What we spelling, right? Casting spells, Maybe. cursing, we curse. We, and any anytime we curse outwards, we curse inwards. And right. so that's another aspect, recognizing that the word is the physical manif manifestation of the energetic. And with our word as our wands, we create our realities. And so that is another thing we talk about a lot is, is when you can master how you feel, the energetics, what you think, that thought creates neurochemicals that flow throughout the body and what we speak into the world. We're often so programmed to speak what we don't want. Oh, I don't want to be late today. Oh, I don't want to lose my money. Oh, I don't want Kevin to think negatively. Oh, I don't want to. Well, what about talking about what we do want? Oh, I you do want. want to receive more money. I do want health. I do want my body to feel good. I do want to be liked. I yeah. am liked. I am and claiming those and reinforcing those to puff out that poke po and get the energy flowing in that beautiful way filled with that Sami energy, because that's where we are in that mastery. And, and from there, which is the whole point of this optimization is being the most self-actualized version of yourself is what do you want to create with this one yeah. life as you that you get? Yeah. yeah. The word is so powerful. The Bible tells us in the beginning, there was the word mm. before there was any creation at all. The word vibrated out and started to activate potential right it, it all became this but in the beginning there was the word this is this is true in our lives be careful what you say be careful what you think these are powerful forces that you're unleashing that's you it use them for good mm -hmm. yeah th thank you so much for sharing that framework and for sharing this wisdom and something I, I want to go even deeper into is 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 it some of more of the the physical medicines that you work with because for myself in my journey I've done many 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 years of personal work and self development and self love and healing and all of the natural medicines and the mindset work and the NLP and the coaching the therapy and the somatics and all of that and that helped a lot and yet there was so much deeper 
gunk that I was carrying that I have not had any kind of results with in the same way that I did working with the medicine ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And this medicine ayahuasca, when I share it with people, what that, what's that like? Well, there's many ways I could share this, but one of the ways that I say is it's like 10,000. It, for me, it was 10,000 years of healing, 10,000 years. I don't know how I could have ever done that with a therapist or with breath work or with anything. I went into my DNA. I cleared out and excavated my DNA. I went into 10,000 years of past lives. I went into ancestral lineage. I did so much deep, deep clearing and excavating and alchemizing that I don't know how I could have ever done that without this medicine. And maybe there are ways I hadn't found it. But for me, working with ayahuasca, and now it's been, I guess, over six years that I, you know, my first session was with you and my last one was with you just a few weeks ago. And I, I tell people that for me, and some of you that know my journey, I had a blood cancer situation, chronic illness, a lot of challenges in my life, all the trauma and everything, and and deep genetic, what I will say, genetic issues i will call it that way or or burden and doing the ayahuasca deep 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 work was the thing that changed the trajectory of my life and you see this all the time people their lives completely changed for the better and i'd love to there's not a, a proper way to use with words that you could really explain your experiences with ayahuasca uh, mm. that I can anyways, you can probably do a, a better job. But this is a medicine that yes, it's become more mainstream, and it's become, you know, there are different deviations from it. But the, 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 the pure medicine and the, the way that it helps people and the way that you and, and Carol and the people that you work with help facilitate this. This is I feel a, a piece that that can go so much deeper than what we can do on the surface in this 3D world. And the gratitude I have for this work, it's it's immense and deep and there's not enough words to properly articulate it. And I'd love for you to share, share a little bit about, or a lot about whatever you want to do about, um, about ayahuasca and what it is and how it works, how you work with it, what it can do bringing in the energetic realm and the spirit realm, wherever you want to go with this. I just want to help people understand the power and the potential that ayahuasca can have if it's right. And if, if it's aligned. Yeah. Yeah. So um, first thing about this is that my, my personal philosophy uh, around uh, ayahuasca work is that th this medicine is for everyone, but maybe not everyone should drink ayahuasca. <laughs> you, you, it, it's um, it's a big decision to make. It's it's a very intense experience. It should only be done in the presence of a shaman, because that experience needs to be guided. Um, it's a very very powerful psychedelic. The active ingredient in it is dimethyltryptamine (DMT). Uh, there's a the there's two plants that make the brew. So one is the vine, which is ayahuasca (Banisteriopsis capi). The other one is a green leaf called chacruna or Psychotria veridis, and the chacruna actually is what has the dimethyltryptamine in it. But dimethyltryptamine is not orally active because you have an enzyme in your gut that suppresses it because dimethyltryptamine is act actually fairly ubiquitous in our world. There's a lot of, a, a lot of foods that we eat, uh, green leafy vegetables, grass fed meat, things like that. They, it all contains some amount of dimethyltryptamine, but there's an enzyme called monoamine oxid oxidase in the gut that suppresses it and keeps it from passing the blood brain barrier and becoming active. The ayahuasca vine is an MAO inhibitor. It inhibits that enzyme and allows it to be early active. So this, this in and of itself is unique because it's the only plant medicine that we uh, know of so far that requires two different plants to make it work, right? There's, there's psilocybin, there's peyote, there's uh, wachuma, things like this. One plant, but 
ayahuasca brew requires two plants. When we go into ceremony with ayahuasca, what we're doing is we're communing with a powerful, benevolent, intelligent spirit of nature who wants to help us, who wants to teach us the things that we need to know about ourselves, that wants to clean our bodies and clean our hearts and clean our mind and clean our spirit so that we can eliminate the the residual energy, the things that are clouding the lens through which we're seeing the world, see things more clearly, lead a better life. Spirit of ayahuasca wants to heal us. It wants to help our bodies function better and higher and more efficiently to rid us of disease and ailment and lingering issues that we've carried forward from earlier times in our life. This is what she wants to do for us. If we properly prepare ourselves and we come physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually ready to make that communion, communion with this benevolent spirit, then amazing things start to happen. We start to see the truth of our lives. We start to see who we are in this world. Who, who is Kevin in this relationship to this person, in relationship to this situation? Is Kevin in right relation to those things? And what do I need to do to change those things? What's going on in my body? Are there things that need to be purged out? With ayahuasca, we do a lot of purging, right? So what are the physical things that I'm carrying around in my body? Is it, is it you know, cancerous cells? Is it a virus? Is it, you know, or, or is it something energetic that's happening in the physical system? Yeah, uh, what what's going on in my heart? What's going on in my mind? What what needs to be cleaned out of these so that I can heal from the weight of these burdens that I've been carrying throughout my life? She's incredible. She's incredible. And she always gives us what we need in these ceremonies. It may not always be what you hear about on social media, because these are the most fantastic stories of it oh i was shot out of a cannon on the back of a fire breathing dragon and i traveled across the universe at light speed slaying demons with my flaming sword okay i mean that's great for a good facebook post it's not always like that and we want to manage our expectations right sometimes it's not that grandiose sometimes it's just a process of like seeing into our lives seeing into our past, seeing into our relationships, looking at our body, our mind, our heart, our spirit, knowing what needs to be done. Yeah, so it sounds like really, from what I've experienced, being open to what needs to be shown, what needs to be revealed, what needs to be healed, what needs to be taught, and not coming with a strong grip of an expectation of what's going to happen. Right, yeah. right. The mother knows what we need. Like, so, uh, you know, we just came out of a retreat a few days ago. Uh, first night, very, very calm. People were not dropping into the medicine really deeply. Only a few people got the visuals. Um, it was very peaceful, very quiet, very restful. Because that's what the group needed. People had traveled. We had people from all over the world. People were tired. They're just trying to get settled in. The mother kept everything nice and calm, nice and peaceful, nice and restful. So tonight we come back into ceremony. Boom, it was explosive. Everybody drops in the medicine really, really fast. People are purging. People are seeing visuals. It's like the whole thing just, you know, it was it was like it was complete, like, just like it, as if it was completely different medicine. Yeah. She gives us what we need when we need it. That's why we learn to trust her. Right? It's good to go in with expectations, but uh, not so much. Right? Surrend yeah. Surrender to what the mother wants and, and just receive the benefits. Mm, and even the intention and the preparation is such a part of it. Even being there and the commitment and yes. being you know, off grid for a few days and sitting and witnessing and holding and purifying the body and the mind and the energetics. And 
withstanding from certain things and going in and having an intention to, I want to bring awareness. I want to be in communion with the spirit, with myself, with this group, with the shaman to go and to face myself. And I talk about alchemy. I use the framework of alchemy a lot. And the first step of alchemy is always observation. We need to see, we need to observe what is so that it can break down so it can be rebuilt. And my experience with ayahuasca is exactly that. We prepare, we get our tools out, we set the stage, we're, we're, we're getting ourselves ready and we go and we our eyes are peeled wide open and we just get to see, we get to right. observe, we, we get to be pulled sometimes into ourselves, sometimes outside of ourselves, where we get to really take a honest look at ourselves like one of my experiences was I was pinned down <laughs> energetically and my eyes were pulled open and the medicine screamed at me this is my first ceremony look at yourself look at yourself look at yourself and all of the illusions were ripped off and it was painful it was extremely extremely painful for me and that's what I needed because I had lived in denial and under illusions and veils and so many layers of disconnection from myself and stuffing, stuffing myself with experiences and foods and people and things. And it, there was just so much gunk between me and me. And so all of that was removed. And so you can really observe and, yeah. and, and then the breakdown and then the breakthrough and then the rebuilding. Right. And something that's important to, to note, and you can expand on this, is that ayahuasca is not just meant to fix you. It's not just this band-aid solution that's meant to fix you. It's meant to reveal and show and and heal and shift and then a big part of it is also the integration on how you get to continue and you get to take responsibility and ownership and integrate and i'd love for you to share that because this is a piece of mastery no one's just going to come here and wave a wand and and heal you uh but you get to also continue on and so can you share a little bit more about that process the integration and the becoming and taking what is revealed and actually embodying it yeah, I'm so glad that you brought this up, Samantha. This is such an important thing. You know, when we gather in ceremony, we do this as a community. Even though it's an experience of deep personal transformation, we do it in a community so that we can bear witness to each other's healing, support our brothers and sisters in the process that they're going through. In a, a, a very, very non-judgmental environment, very open and accepting and loving and compassionate environment. This work is not about ayahuasca ceremonies. I know this sounds counterintuitive coming from an ayahuasquero. That ceremony, it's just a moment in our life. What really counts is what happens next. Can you now take what you learn? and go out into the world and live your medicine to create a life around you like the one you had in retreat where other people are being kind and gentle and compassionate and supportive. It's easy to do at a retreat, right? We set the rules. We make the guidelines. This is how it's going to be. We make a little container for it. We keep it all in there. But I'm now so interested in what you're doing in your life outside of the retreat, outside of ceremony? Are you living your medicine? Are you being kind and gentle and compassionate, even in the most stressful situations? Are you taking care of yourselves? Are you seeing reality clearly? Are you looking at your relations and making sure that you're staying in right relation with all of the things around you, the people, the situations, the event, your culture, nature? Are you in right relation? There's no point in going through the ceremony and the potential ordeal of a ceremony if you're not prepared then to go out and live your medicine in the world. That's what ayahuasca is about, not, not the ceremony. Mm. All it's about this... healing yourself and optimizing yourself so that you can be a powerful force for, for wellness and beauty and love and joy out there in the world that you're operating in. And, th and that's the thing with gifts, right? Whether it be the gift of going to a ceremony, which is uh, extremely powerful, it's monumentous. It's the gift of the, the God-given or spirit-given gifts that you have, whether that be your voice or your talents, your art, your creativity. You can be given gifts. You can be given the keys to the universe. You can be shown it all. And yet that means nothing. 
Knowledge is not power. Knowledge is not power until it is embodied. And that's where true wisdom comes through. And so the medicine that I feel with ayahuasca is it reveals and it shows and it gives gifts and it clears. And yet it's, it's just, it's just that knowledge. Now it's up to you to take it, digest it, embody it, be it, and go and, and live it out in the world. And that's something that no one can do for you. No. And it's not anyone's job to do that for you. It's your opportunity responsibility to go out and do that Um, yeah it's not a panacea it's not a silver bullet it's not going to like just fix you but it is going to make you clear and make you aware but the thing to remember is that once we form this relationship with this benevolent beautiful spirit of nature mother ayahuasca you are not alone you're working with her now she's an ally so it's okay. It's okay for us to make mistakes. We talked about this. We live in a, a universe of energy. Energy can be described as a waveform. And that's exactly what our life is going to look like. The road between here and enlightenment is not a straight line. That would be a trick <laughs> because we live in a universe of energy. It's going to look like this. Yep, some days I'm going to be the Buddha. And other days, I'm going to be that guy yelling a lady in the parking lot over a shopping cart. (laughs) And I'm not going to take myself too seriously when I'm the Buddha. And I'm not going to take myself too seriously and get too down on myself when I'm having a bad day. My interactions aren't that great. Because when you're up here, there's one thing you can know for sure. There's one of these in your future. When you're down here, there's one thing you can know for sure. There's one of these in your future. It just means that you're doing it, you're riding the ride, you're doing it the way the system is designed, you're living by natural law, you're going to have ups and downs. Hopefully, my low point today is higher than my high point was a year ago. That's how we know we're on the road to enlightenment. That's it. And Go with- easy. Take it easy on yourself. Don't try so hard. Don't work so much. <laughs> and with these tools, we can build resiliency and have the tools where the lows don't need to be spiraling lows, where we recognize, oh, I'm in a low. That's okay. I have compassion. What's a tool I can use? How can I bring myself out of this low back up into the Sami energy, back up into the high frequency, back up into my alignment? And this this is a beautiful tool. And so my, my hope and intention and my knowingness is that everything you've shared today And all of this wisdom and these tools can help everyone watching to be empowered, to have a toolkit of, oh, okay, this awareness, this mastery, this coming back into alignment, this releasing, this recalibrating. And if for anyone who, you know, is watching this from your end, they obviously know how powerful ayahuasca is and the medicine work and being in ceremony. And for anyone who has not, you know, I love Kevin says, he's like, I don't recommend anyone do ayahuasca. I don't tell right. anyone to do ay- ayahuasca. But if you feel called, one of the things I want to share with anyone watching this feeling like, oh, wow, this seems like I'm pulled to this is I want to make sure that everyone is doing their homework to make sure that where they are taking ayahuasca, who they are sitting with mm-hmm. is in alignment and is in right relationship with the medicine. And, and I've heard, you can hear horror stories. There are people, unfortunately, that are serving medicine who are absolutely 0% qualified. They're putting, you know, ayahuasca in cups and sticking it in people and putting on a playlist from Spotify with some music Icaros and there's no integration. There's no holding. This is something that's just not a drink. There's, there is, it's a spiritual experience. It's communing with spirits. There's energies moving and that requires an immense amount of skill and experience and ability to navigate that. And if you want to have a really bad experience, we'll go and drink ayahuasca off the streets anywhere. If you want to have the best opportunity to have a really good and safe experience, it is so monumentally, and I cannot stress this enough, important to do research, to get testimonials and to interview your shaman, to make sure that it's there, that they have done the work, that they have done the training, that they have the ability, that they're in a Sami energy. And so, you know, I've also, I'll give a little story. I've had an experience with a shaman that was in, very in a dark space and 
did not, was not able to hold the energy and it was very painful. It was very challenging. And I don't think I got anything out of it apart from a reminder to only work with Kevin, <laughs> only work with Kevin and Carol was my experience. And, and I'm sure there are other amazing shamans, but Kevin, can you talk to that a little bit when somebody is looking for a, a shaman, what are they looking for? Or when they're looking for a safe experience, what are some of the, the check marks that they want to be looking for? Yeah, I think, uh, thanks for this, because this is this is a really important subject. Um, okay, so you want to look for a shaman who's actually been through an apprenticeship. Uh, I, an ayahuasca apprenticeship takes years. Mine, mine was five years long, mine and Carol's. And um, you want somebody who's uh, ideally connected to a lineage, although that's not mandatory it's good to know that that shaman also has a teacher and he has somebody he or she has somebody that can um that, that they can go to for advice and guidance as well um the ikros the music that is played the songs that are sung during the ceremony are very very important to uh very important to the ceremony and vibration to curate the energy in the room. We use it to move stagnant energy through the room. We use it to protect the room. We use it to move the ceremony from one, one section to another. So I, I believe that it's really important that who, whoever the shaman is that you're drinking, ideally you're drinking it with the shaman and, and that that shaman has their own ikaros. These ikaros, this is our medicine. And um, and it, it's 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 one of the tools that we use to keep the ceremony under control. Uh, a shaman should be putting you in dieta before the retreat. There's foods that we don't want you to eat. There's um, medications that we don't want you to take. There's even herbal supplements that we don't want you to take. Some pharmaceuticals can be deadly. Antidepressants can be deadly, okay? And there's so many people that are on antidepressants. It's, it's a bad combination. It, 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 it's, um, you wanna be very, very careful with this. Even simple things like antihistamines can cause some problems. So you want a shaman who understands drug interactions, who can provide you with a comprehensive list of contraindicated medications and supplements, that can recommend a diet for you that prepares you physically, spiritually, psychologically, emotionally for what it is that you're about to do. And then you want a shaman who's accessible to you so that during your ceremony experience, while you're at the retreat, before you ever go to the retreat, after the retreat's over and you've returned home, that that shaman is accessible to you. That if there's something that comes up for you, you should have a way to contact them so that they can have a one-on-one -on -one with you and talk you through that. Okay. So I think these are really important things. And, and then one other thing that I would stress is that recognize that the vine has escaped the jungle. I always do it does. It's spreading all over the world. This was done on purpose. The indigenous healers of the Amazon sent this medicine out into the world to heal the world before we all destroyed it. So it's not necessary for you to get on an airplane and travel for 17 hours, go to South America, uh, have to worry about the water and the food and the language barrier, all that stuff. It, I'm not saying don't do that, but if if this is if you're considering your first time that is an extra level of stress that you're putting on your body that's not really necessary there are plenty of really good well-trained effective ayahuasca in north america in europe they're, they're scattered all over the world now this knowledge has been taught and 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 there's all, all kinds of people are, are serving medicine so get recommendations view with the shaman who's going to be pouring your medicine feel it in your body tap into your subtle awareness when i'm talking to this guy 
Do I feel like this is the person, this is the man or woman who I want to be in control of the ceremony when I drink ayahuasca? Is that the, the, who the shaman is, is, is very, very important. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, a lot of the people that go to your ceremonies, I don't think would ever be able to go to any other ceremonies after being with you, Carol. And I feel the same way. And even, even just the music that you play, I mean, you and Carol have been musicians for 30 plus years and the amount of instruments that you play, the, the voice, the, the, the music medicine that comes through is it's, it's one of the best concerts you could ever go to for, you know, six to eight hours a night for three nights. And, and, and that, that alone, like you said, the Ikaros carry the medicine and I don't see how that could be replaced with somebody who's putting on a Spotify playlist and even the whole vibration of that and the set and the setting. I talk about this all the time with any medicines that you use set and setting and intention are a major, major aspect. And so Thank you so much for creating a community and a set and a setting that is so supportive, so healing and very, very in integrity and in alignment to facilitate such amazing transformation and healing for people. I, I am beyond grateful. I just looked at the time and we're almost at two hours here. And I feel like we're just, just <laughs> scraping the surface on, on what you know, and you can teach um, for your community. People know how to reach you for my community and where we're going to share this, I feel like I put it in the comments where more private, if if that feels good with you, where people can reach out to you, unless there's anything you want to share now where people can connect with you. If not, uh, we can put it in a more of a, a private way that people can connect with you. Um, is there anything else that you want to share on connection on anything that we've touched on any final words, anything else that you want to leave us with before we close out this conversation? Oh, I just want everybody to realize how powerful they actually are. And by doing some very simple things to help to rehabilitate our energy system, the possibilities expand and expand. Great things are closer at hand than you'll ever know. But you got to get this energetic system revitalized and rehabilitated and put to work for you so that you can actually become an architect of your own reality, the writer of your own story, the maker of your own movie. This is within all of our potential. You don't have to be shamanic. You don't have to be deeply spiritual. This is very pragmatic information, right? So if we can, uh, as this information seeps out and, and gets reestablished here, I, I think we're gonna see a lot of people uh, get a lot of benefits from it. And I, Samantha, I want to thank you so much. You're such a beautiful person and such a good friend. And your friendship means so much to me. And for you to create this opportunity to share this kind of wisdom, to help me with my responsibility to the Kauro people, which was to uh, take this wisdom and teach it and help them fulfill their obligation to this prophecy. You're helping me fulfill my obligations to the Kero and to this prophecy. And I just hope that this information just continues to expand and expand and expand. I hope all your popos expand, take in more Sami energy, take up more space, become vital and resilient and powerful and create the life that you want for yourself. So what I pray for everyone. Aho. Oh. And that and 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 so it is. Kevin, we're gonna end on that. That was so beautiful, so perfect. Thank you so very much. Would you prefer, do you want to share how people can contact you? Or is that something that we slip yeah. in the comments? Yeah. So um if you're interested in the work that we're doing, our organization is called Vida Brigante. Vida Brigante means bright life, and that's what we want for people. So uh, the best way to um, find us is on our website, which is uh, vidabrajante.org, vidabrajante.org. Uh, there's a sign-up page there. You can The website, you can read about some of the things that we do. We don't talk about ayahuasca or wachuma on our website, but we do talk about many of the other shamanic services that we offer. And um, there's a sign-up list, and you can join our community and get on our email list so we can keep you up to date on different offerings, different retreats. Um, we've got a bunch of new stuff in the works right now and um, different ways that we're going to start teaching people and um, uh, sending out information 
Uh, we're going to be leading excursions to different uh, sacred sites around the world. That's in the planning stages right now. Got a lot going on, and that's the best way you can uh, be in touch with this is vitabrajante.org. Amazing. Thank you so much. Well, I am so excited for this to get out and for everyone watching this, you are a part of the prophecy. You are a part of the medicine. And my greatest invitation for you is to turn this knowledge into true wisdom, to embody it, to create it, to do something with it and to go out, like Kevin said, be the architect of your reality and to truly live your best life and inspire others to do the same. That's what it's all about. So thank you all so much for being here. Kevin, I love you so much. Until we talk again. Samantha, blessings to you and blessings to all of your viewers and your listeners. Bendiciones, bendiciones, bendiciones.